Hi everybody, welcome to the IATL and welcome to the live webinar with Western Systems and Applied Information. And in today's show, we're going to be talking about using technology to streamline workflows and to improve uh, saving time and money. And today we've got a very special guest. We've got John Fasana from um, Washington County. But before we go into any of the introductions, I'm going to hand over to Alana, who's going to take us through a little bit of housekeeping. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, yeah, just some housekeeping. In your upper right-hand corner of your screen, there is a speaker view button. You would want to click that to have the best possible experience today. We also have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please put any questions you might have in there, and we'll make sure that those get answered for you. Um, we also have a YouTube link, live YouTube link in the chat box, if you'd like to use that or share that with anybody. And then very importantly, if you would like Applied Information or Western Systems to contact you um, after this webinar, please put your please contact me in, in the chat box and we'll definitely get, um, get back to you on that. So with that, Peter, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, introduce our first guest, John Fasana. He is the Principal Traffic Engineer with Washington County. Um, welcome, John. Yeah, hello. Thank you, Alana and Peter. I'm, I'm glad to be here and really excited about the show today. Awesome. And then um, our second guest today is Jason Spencer. He is the Territory Manager um, at Western Systems. Um, and proud to have you on here with us today as our partner and our distributor in the Northwest. Thank you, Jason. Thank you guys for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Back to you, Peter. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Alana, for all the introductions. And uh, I really appreciate having both of our guests on the show today. Uh, the first thing I wanted to go forward was um, John, you know, maybe you want to just take us through a little bit of a background of who is John Fasana, what do you do at uh, Washington County, a bit of a background of, of, of what you're doing in this, in this industry. Yeah, no, of course, Peter. Um, so as uh, Lana current mentioned, I'm currently a principal engineer and I manage the traffic engineering group for Washington County, which is actually in the state of Oregon. Um, we've got about 30 staff on our team, and we're, we're responsible for the traffic signals, the lighting, the signing and striping, and basically all the traffic control devices throughout Washington County. Um, I've been with Washington County for just under 10 years now, and prior to my experience here, I, was, I spent 10 years working in the consulting world uh, in Northern California and Nevada for a company called Fair and Piers. Um, and I went to school at Portland State University and where I got my degree in civil engineering. Awesome, awesome. Well, we really appreciate it. And um, you know, we, we've seen so many great projects that you guys have been doing in Washington County. And I think your leadership has definitely led to all of these things happening in that area. Uh, I wanted to move over to Jason. And Jason, maybe you can take us through a little bit of, about Western Systems, what Western Systems actually does and a bit of your background as well. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, thank you, Peter and Alana. Again, I, I really appreciate you guys giving us this the opportunity to uh, reach out to so many people. And John, thank you very much for hopping on this as well. Without you, we wouldn't be anything. Uh, so I'm Jason Spencer. I'm the Territory Manager with Western Systems. I cover Oregon and the Bay Area in Northern California. Um, Western Systems itself, we're based out of Everett, Washington. We uh, were founded in about 2001, so we're quickly approaching our 20th year in business. Uh, when we first got started, all we were really doing was making uh, traffic signal cabinets for the state of Washington. We had a really small facility with, I think, only a five-man crew at that point. Uh, we quickly found that it was beneficial for our customers to have a single provider who can supply all the equipment you need at the streets today. Uh, so started growing our collection of offerings to our customers. So now we can offer everything from cabinets to controllers, uh, central system software, detection, and obviously we've got the AI product that we're really proud of as well. Um, we've been constantly growing our product lines as well to go into RFBs, school zone flashers, and uh, we've connected agencies with their intersections with radios and switches. Uh, with our growing product line, we've also grown our competence and expertise, uh, with the goal being the one place for our customers to go to from start to finish with all their products. Um, 
as our product line has grown, so does our reach. So no longer are we just out of Washington. Uh, now we cover Alaska, Idaho, Montana, uh, Oregon, and California. Um, so we've really made it our goal to cover as many people as possible with our customer support oriented business plan. Uh, to look at current day, uh, you know, we do have a special situation going on. Our, man our manufacturing facility is still fully operational. Uh, we've made some slight changes to our staffing to better accommodate social distancing. Uh, we are doing split shifts now so that we can keep things rolling out on a timely manner. So I, you know, I always gotta give a huge shout out to our team up north uh, to make sure that they're, they're keeping things going. Uh, me, myself personally, I've been in the traffic industry for about four years now. Uh, my relationship with John started about three and a half years ago with another company, Blue Mac Analytics. He, again, was working alongside the other guys over there at Washington County to get some cutting edge technology out on the streets. And uh, since then, it's been a growing relationship. I'm, I'm really happy to uh, be in the Portland area so close to him and have him as one of my customers here at Western. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Jason. Um, you know, and, and that's an interesting thing, John, we hear it from a lot of different people, you know, about you innovating with technology. Can you talk about some of the cool technology that you guys have, not just the AI equipment, but, you know, all of the technology that you guys have actually got deployed in uh, Washington County? Yeah, no, uh, of course. Um, so really, as I said, mentioned, you know, we control all of our signal systems. And so really the vast majority of our technology projects are usually geared around the signals and some of the devices that we hang from them or connect to them. We've got a bunch of PTZ cameras out there and Bluetooth readers, um, all kinds of different detection devices, communications. Uh, we've got three adaptive signal system deployments and, and there's two others that we're currently working on. So a lot going with signals. Um, our biggest focus uh, probably since I've been here has been really, you know, building out our fiber communication system. So the past seven, eight years, we've gone from, I think zero signals connected into a central system to around, around 200. And so um, outside of signals, uh, we've, also, we've also connected all of our school flashers and we deployed some more rural devices like, like the flood, uh, floodgate systems, snow zones, and curve warning systems. Awesome, awesome. No, it's exciting, um, you know, what you've been doing there. And, um, you know, what I, I know, John, you've, you've prepared a bit of a presentation that you're gonna share with us today. Um, and we wanted to go through that presentation with you. Maybe you can um, share your screen and uh, we can go through you know, as, as you talk through the presentation, because John's prepared this where he's got, you know, he's talking about all of these different things about how the technology has saved time and saved money uh, for, for himself. So John, can you go and uh, share your screen and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, cut back to you in, in, um, with, with your presentation. Just bear with us as yeah. we go through this. There we go. Of we, course. So uh, let me know when you when you guys can all see it. We you, can see it. You perfect. Okay. Great. That worked. All right. So again, I've already introduced myself. I'm John Fasana. Um, and yeah. So today, my presentation is going to be about using intelligent transportation systems to to streamline workflows. Uh, so the agenda for this presentation, I'm going to start out, give a brief background to Washington County for you guys. And then we'll talk about what I mean by streamlining workflows with ITS systems. Um, we'll run through a few use, use case studies and hopefully at the end there'll be time for questions. Yeah, everybody, do you want to just go ahead and, and while he's busy talking about all these things, put in your questions. Um, and then as soon as John's finished with his presentation, Alana is going to ask all the questions that you have. So any questions that you have, just type them in right now. Thanks, Great. Peter. Okay, uh, Washington County. So, quick background here. So, we're we are Washington County in the state of Oregon, which can be confusing sometimes. Um, we're located at the western end of the Portland metro area. Basically, we include cities of Beaverton, Hillsboro, Tualatin, Tigard, Forest Grove. Uh, we got a population of about six hundred thousand residents, and we're one of the fastest growing counties in Oregon. So I'm with our traffic engineering group. We maintain and operate about 350 traffic signals. We've got 190 flashers, uh, lighting systems, communications, ITS devices, and about 1,300 centerline miles of signing and striping. Uh, 
We've got about 30 employees on staff, and uh, this is kind of my shameless plug for the day. We're soon looking to hire another traffic engineer when, uh, when they let us start hiring again after things normalize. <laughs> okay, so let, let's talk about uh, streamlining workflows and kind of the focus of this presentation. Um, within our own traffic signal as ITS work group, you know, we, we're getting pretty good at using ITS tools to help, help find efficiency for our day-to-day -day work, things like uh, setting up traffic monitoring cameras and remote access to signals so we can monitor and update timings without having to sit there out in the field, uh, or like setting up automated alerts on our signals so when they go into flash, you know, they, they, they send us alerts, email, and kind of to improve our response times. So today, however, I'm, I'm going to talk about a few use cases where, where we've had opportunities to team up on some more focused ITS projects with, with other local agencies and other internal departments here at the county to help help them utilize our ITS resources to streamline kind of internal workflows and provide better traveler information to the public. So, you know, by helping these other departments and local agencies save, save staff time and resources, we're really trying to make their jobs easier and it helps us all with getting better information out to the public. And in turn, you know, we're, we're both, we're building good working relationships. We're building support and goodwill towards our, our ITS program as a whole. And then you see down at the bottom right here, the traveling public, uh, he's happy because they're, they're well informed and, and they feel their tax dollars are being spent wisely, which is important. So uh, moving on to the fun part now, the use cases. So the use cases I'm gonna cover today, these are all ITS devices that we operate via wireless communications uh, through, through AI's cloud-based system. And, and this is separate from our TLC network that we use to control our traffic signals. Um, some of the benefits of this system I, I see, and I, you know, I'm not a networking expert, but this is just from my perspective, is you know, we, th these have been, it's, it's been a low entry cost to get into these. So a lot of times for these devices, we've just had to establish a cell connection and power, power to our field equipment. Um, you know, all these devices, we can access them with just an internet connection. So this gives us the ability to log in and monitor from home, from Starbucks, or, or, or really anywhere else without needing to establish remote desktop connections. Um, I'm able to access it with my phone, a laptop, or a tablet. So anywhere I'm at, good or bad, uh, I can log in and, and monitor with, as long as I got my phone on me. Um, you know, the, they're low maintenance for us. Uh, as long as we got the cell connection working and, and power to the site, th these systems should work properly. And there's, uh, there's really overall, there, there's limited IT support needed on, on our end because everything's hosted at a, through AI. Um, some of the potential cons I see with this, you, you know, I, I, I feel like it could potentially be a little less secure than our, than our TLC network. So you know, the, the devices we run on this system, they're less critical than our traffic signals, so I don't see this as a huge, huge concern. Um, there can be data limitations, I, I, I think. Uh, uh, most of these devices, they just, they're set to update once every 30 minutes or when something changes. So this wouldn't be ideal probably for applications where you need real-time data or live video streaming, or maybe you'd be, need to upgrade your, your cell plan. Um, and finally, this, I don't know if this is much of a con because everywhere we have internet access, nowadays, but you, you, need, you do need internet access to be able to access these devices. Okay, so moving on to our use cases. Uh, the three projects I'm gonna cover today, these are gonna be our school flashers, uh, floodgates, and snow zones. So first off, our, our school flasher project. Um, the map you see here on the right, this is from the web interface we use to operate the system. And on the left are some of the monitoring and scheduling tools that we use. So if any of you currently use AI's, the, the Glance system, I'm sure this all looks very familiar to you. Um, this project, this was our first dive into this cloud-based platform. We, we collaborated with our local agency partners, as many of the school zones in the county, they, they span both county and city roads. So that as a county, we maintain and operate about 150 school flashers for ourselves and our local agencies. Our school flashers, um, they used to operate on an old pager-based system, and it was very time-intensive to program, and we struggled to keep up with battery maintenance at, at the solar-powered locations. I think programming each school year, it, it was about a month-long process, and, and we were very reactive with our maintenance, basically chasing battery issues based on calls from the public. 
So to address these issues, um, we upgrade our entire system now to, to, this, to this AI system. So it now allows for group scheduling across schools or entire school districts, and also gives us alerts for mismatches between flashers. Um, we receive maintenance alerts through email for low battery or bulb outages, so we can, we can start proactively responding to those. And we've also improved our system monitoring tools, um, which helps us trouble issues more efficiently. So and some of the highlights, you know, as a result of this project, you know, we, we've been able to reduce staff time for scheduling all of our school flashers from about four weeks to one to two days. Um, this saves us money and saves the agencies money that we do maintenance for. We've been able to reduce staff time for troubleshooting. Again, this, this saves us all money. And uh, we've, we've been able to reduce incoming calls and service requests. So service requests for school flashers, they've, they've gone from about 40 to 50 a year to less than 10. Um, and finally, we, uh, we've been able to improve response times to public requests about the operations. You know, I, I think the big piece is the public really trusts now that these flashers are, are operating and on at the correct times. So, you know, thanks to ITS here, we, we're saving money, we're building goodwill towards our ITS program, and we're gaining support from the traveling public. John, so, do you want to just take yes. us through a little bit about um, the... Um, you know how you dealt with with COVID with your with your school zones. You know during during the whole situation. Obviously, schools are very uncertain when they're going to go back. But I mean, obviously, you've got firsthand experience of of what you've been doing there. Yeah, no, that that that's a that's a good point. So um, when it hit, I mean, the nice thing about this system is we were able to basically turn all the flashers off um, in one day countywide as, as school districts kind of closed operations. So it made us, it made us able to respond to things like this a, a lot quicker than we would have been able to in the old pager based system. So uh, since probably mid-March or so when kids stopped going to school, our, our school beacons have not, have not been flashing, which, which has been great. Um, you know, that's one of the things coming up. It's going to be difficult now as we're kind of getting to school. There's just a lot of unknowns. And so you know, I think the, the system's gonna be helpful for us to be a little bit, um, just to kind of anticipate a little a little better as schools make changes and be able to respond to those a little quicker with operations. So there, there's just so many unknowns right now that we can't really get ahead, a jump ahead on scheduling. Usually this time of year, we're, uh, we're kind of gathering all the school calendars and making sure we've got all, you know, all their days off and everything. And so now we're just gonna have to wait till last minute, but Luckily, uh, we should be able to work with them. Yeah, we're seeing very much similar kinds of things here in Georgia, where uh, even in districts themselves, there are certain schools that are planning to go back and other schools aren't planning to go back. And it's kind of changing on a weekly, daily kind of basis. Um, so, you know, obviously having the, the flexibility of changing those things is, is definitely going to make life a little easier than sending someone backwards and forwards each time to go out and reprogram these things. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, especially when you've got uh, 150 or so, or I'm sure there are agencies you guys work with with much more than that as well. Yeah, sorry sorry to cut into your presentation there. Go for it. No, that's great. Uh, okay, so our next use case, moving on, let's see. So I'm gonna talk now about our, this is a floodgate system we put in. So. Um, this is a project we collaborated with our road operations and maintenance group to kind of help them streamline their work process for, for closing the road when flooding occurs. So the, these floodgates, they're located south of the city of Forest Grove on a road called Fernhill Road. It's a section of road. It, it typically floods uh, about three to four times a year. And there have been, there've been multiple high water rescues that have had to be performed over the past years due to, due to drivers going around the barricades. Um, so we wanted to install a system that would allow for remote monitoring and make, make our closure process more efficient. Um, we decided to use the same platform as the school flasher system, really because it, you know, it, it was able to meet our basic operational objectives for one. Uh, we were familiar with it and we knew it would be easy to set up access for our road operations group um, for them to be able to get in and, and, and view and monitor and change things. So uh, what you see here, this is a screenshot of the remote monitoring interface for the uh, floodgate system, very similar to our school flashers. Um, 
our, our floodgate system, so we installed this in 2018, and the system in includes, a, there's a water depth sensor, some gate status relays, LED flashers, and, and cameras. And the system basically monitors itself with the water depth sen sensor, and it sends out an email alert to staff when water levels reach a user-defined threshold. And this kind of gives staff a heads up to start monitoring, uh, monitoring the system remotely. So when they, make, when they do finally make the determination to close the road, uh, a crew sent out, go out, go close and lock the gates. This activates the flashing beacons, which then alerts drivers of the closure. Um, so on the screen here, every 30 minutes or so, the, the snapshot in the upper right hand is refreshed, as well as all the values on system voltages, the water level, and the gate status. Um, the relay for the gate mounted flashers can also be remotely toggled on and off through the system by, by clicking on the little blue button you see in the middle. So now the processes. Um, this is one of the biggest direct benefits the county has seen from this project. It, you know, it's, it's helped our road operations group really streamline their workflow process for closing the road in these flood situations. So the, the flow chart you, you see here, this briefly shows our old process uh, before the project was complete. So at the beginning of the rainy season, crews would stage barricades off the side of the road, then supervisors would monitor uh, the closest upstream water gauge. It was about three miles away. Um, when the gauge hit a certain level, you know, then they'd start dispatching a crew to check if water was cresting over the road. And if not, then that kind of this periodic monitoring dispatch cycle, it'd continue until the road the road either did need to be closed or the water level started to recede. So what this meant was that crews were often dispatched multiple times before any, any action was actually needed. Um, and then if the road did need to be closed to flooding, this, this monitoring dispatch cycle would basically continue in reverse until the water receded and the road could then be reopened. So and once again, this meant that crews were often being dispatched multiple times again before any action was needed to open the road back up. So now, uh, this is looking at the workflow process after our floodgate project. So, you know, you, you can see basically we were able to gain efficiencies by removing these cyclical processes of sending crews out multiple times. So now once the water gauge, it hits a certain level, the, the system sends out an automated alert via email or text to notify the supervisors. At that point, supervisors then can begin monitoring the camera feed and the water level data, and they don't need to dispatch a crew really till they're, till they're really needed to go out and close the road. Um, and then once the road is closed, you know, the supervisors, they're able to use these same tools within the system, continue monitoring until they know that the water level is receded. Once it's receded, then they can dispatch a crew to go out. They usually have to clear the road of debris or anything else on there and then open it back up to traffic. So you can see as a result, all this, we've, we've again, we've been able to reduce staff time. So eliminating the, crew, the need for crews to make multiple trips to the site to monitor saves our road operations group staff time and money. Uh, we've been able to improve response times. So the remote monitoring capability, this allows for quicker response and decision making for closing and reopening the road once conditions change, which helps build public trust. And we're able to provide some traveler information. So the camera feeds uh, to this are, are sent to ODOT's statewide traveler information site called TripCheck which provides the basically near real-time video footage of, of the gate and flood status for the system. So you see, again, we've been able to save the county money. We're providing good traveler information. And all this goes a long ways building support and goodwill towards our ITS program. And I think that's also very important that you guys are, are providing, you know, some of that information directly to the public via the, the camera feeds as well, that they can actually see all that information. So I think that's actually a big benefit that people are seeing there as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I know we've already had users, so people are logging in looking at them because we've had users notify us if the camera goes down for whatever reason or something. And so, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see that you put that information out there, people do use it. Hey, John, uh, just something I noticed in your presentation is your diagrams look, um, you know, really neat after the process of implementing the technology and it's really streamlined everything for you and you've mentioned a few times that it saves time and money. Um, just wondering how quickly did you feel the impact of the technology actually helping save um, that time and money for you and streamlining the processes? 
Yeah, no, uh, definitely quickly. So, you know, the, our school flasher system, you know, th these had immediate impact in both just the, the staff time it took us to schedule devices each year and then and the amount of time we spent chasing battery problems. Um, the floodgate system, it, this so that that system, it was utilized four, to four times the year it went in, the first year it went in. And so, you know, it was nice to see uh, you know, it's never good to have to close the road, but it's nice to see that being used and put into use. And so, you know, we saw that right away. The last one I'm going to talk about are our snow zones. You know, either, I don't know, unfortunately or maybe maybe fortunately, we, we had a fairly mild winter this last year. So they, they have not had to been, like, seriously deployed yet. So this next winter, I'm sure we'll see that. Awesome. Thank so you. So you guys get some pretty bad weather out there? Yeah, we, it, you know, it's, we have, it, I guess it depends on, you know, where you live, probably what you, what you determine bad weather. So we probably have a fairly mild climate. We get snow maybe four or five times a year. Um, but when it does snow, you know, we're, we're not geared up with, you know, we don't have like hundreds of snow plows and can get to these quick. And so things shut down and, and the roads get bad pretty quick when it, when we get snow in our area. Sounds, Sounds like Atlanta. Like yes. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it snows here, it just goes absolutely crazy and everything shuts down. But we, we, yeah. we, we definitely have uh, a little bit warmer weather than, uh, than what you guys have there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's, uh, yeah, so now going into the snow zones. Um, so this is kind of my final use case for the day. Um, so th these have been installed basically to help facilitate the implementation on chain, of chain restrictions on our county roads. <clears throat> so at Washington County, we've got we've got three different sections of road basically that have been designated as snow zones during inclement weather, due to high elevations and areas where they've got steep grades. So th these are uh, they're they're shown here on the map. It's it's 175th Avenue or area we call Cooper Mountain, and then as well as Barnes Road and Cornell Road. Uh, in the very northeastern section of our county. Um, these snow zones, they were originally put in with static signs in 2017 by our road operations group. And then they became an ITS project to try and help streamline their activation process. So our, our county snow zones here, you know, they've gone through a bit of an evolution over the past, past few years. Um, the photo you see on the far left this is a snapshot of the first version of snow zone signage that went in. Um, these utilize a set of flip up static signs that were turned around when, when the snow zones were implemented. So, you know, they, it only took us one winter season with these realize that sending a person out to have to climb a ladder, unlock these signs and flip them at eight different locations in an ice or snowstorm was not a great long term solution. Um, so at this point, you know, our road operations group came to us to discuss options for using ITS to help streamline the process. Um, and as an interim measure, our electricians wired in a switch activated flashing beacon and we added wind flashing riders uh, at each location. And this is the photo you basically see in the middle of the screen. So these switches, they simplified the process, but it, it still took multiple hours for someone to drive out to each sign to turn them on and off again. And it also still required us to have to dispatch staff to drive through these areas during inclement weather. So our, our ITS solution now, it, now it allows an operator to basically remotely monitor and activate these beacons from the work from a workstation with the click of a button. Um, again, it's using the same interface that manages our floodgates and school flashers. And, and now it, you know, it takes less than five minutes to activate these snow zones. And we avoid the need to have, in, to have staff driving out to each of these sites. So again, this is a screenshot, a remote monitoring interface for the snow zones. Uh, it looks very similar to the school flashers and, and floodgates. Each of these locations, they're equipped with a camera. You see up in, in the upper right, um, they've got a battery backup system, and they provide voltage monitoring with alerts for switch over to battery backup or, or for low battery voltage. Um, when the decision's made to activate the snow zones, staff can now turn these on and off by, by simply clicking on the little blue button you see there in the middle of the screen. So like the other systems, every 30 minutes, the snapshot in the upper right, this is refreshed and it reports back on system voltages and flasher status. Um, we haven't connected these cameras in, but we do intend to share these camera feeds and, and the road status information through TripCheck as well to provide travel information. And we also have plans for 
a future project to install install weather stations near near many of these locations to provide additional data on road and weather conditions and to help with decision making. Um, and and the weather station data we also intend to share that on TripCheck as well. So here's our process for the snow zones. It's a little more simple than the than the floodgate ones, but um, this basically is showing the direct staff time savings between the old activation process and the new process now that we're able to remotely activate. So the staff time savings, this is an obvious direct benefit, um, but the amount of time it took to activate this flasher, this was also an issue because it meant serious delays in getting this updated information out to the traveling public. And these delays also made enforcement difficult as the sheriff's office unit, they'd have to verify both ends of the restriction were in effect and flashing before they could start enforcing. And then, in, you know, in addition to the, the issues with these delays, there's also a safety benefit received by not having to send additional county staff onto the roads during during winter weather conditions. John, I did a little bit of, uh, of uh, calculations over there just before this, and that shows that it's a 98 percent 98 improvement in time savings that you guys made by doing that project, which is which is insane. Yeah, no, that that that's amazing. When you know when it when it takes you a day or, or two or longer to to activate something, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. So so we've made great success in that department. So yeah, and and uh, once again, so we can see, I, you know, this ITS solution has been able to help us reduce staff time. So the ability to remotely monitor and control this system, it's reduced the time to implement the snow zones from about from about four hours to less than five minutes. So this saves our road operations group staff time and money. Uh, we've been able to improve response times. So the remote monitoring and control it allows for quicker action when road conditions change. And this eliminates the need to send additional crews onto the roads during inclement weather. And we're able to provide traveler information again. So these camera feeds on road status updates to ODOT's trip check site provides relevant and near real-time traveler information. So once again, we're able to save the county money, providing good traveler information. And all this, this is all going a long ways towards building support and goodwill towards our ITS program here in Washington County. Perfect, perfect. Well, and with that, that's the end. That's absolutely awesome. So um, everybody, if you've got any questions, please ask questions in terms of, uh, of, of what we, you know, we've got the expert on the call right now. We've also got Jason Spence as well. You can talk a little bit more about the technology inside of the cabinets um so first of all i wanted to just say john maybe you want to yeah, john's turning on his his video stream here and maybe we just go over to alana to a couple of the questions that you've already received yeah um one of them being john just uh you know there was a or maybe this is for jason or both of you whoever would like to answer this one um, just, you know, there was a consultant involved in these custom projects, you know, helping you guys come up with the design. Um, how did you get your vision over to them um, so that they actually came up with the, 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 the no, sorry, <laughs> the design for you? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can, I can uh, chime in on that. And hopefully you guys are seeing me instead of my presentation now. Yes, we are. Great. Um, so, yeah, we had a consultant, uh, DKS. Uh, helped us so we've got a good relationship with DKS and they, they're familiar with our ITS initiatives and goals they, they, they helped our they helped us with our county ITS plan which was was where many of these concepts originated so for these projects you know each one we, we started out working through a, a basic basically a concept of operations report to kind of help define our requirements and operational objectives for each location um, then once we've kind of worked through all that then then we moved into kind of the design stage and, and then construction and then deployment for each of these projects. So they basically followed that same process uh, for the most part. What, what, is that, what is that process? I mean, how long does it actually take from, you know, because you come up with these great ideas. How long does it actually take from your idea creation to actually getting equipment deployed in the field? What, what's that timeline? I know some people would be quite interested in that. Yeah, no, I, you know, I think... Um, like anything, you know, it, it depends a lot. And so we were fortunate on these projects, one, to have uh, have local funding to be able to, 
to pay for these deployments. And so, you know, I, I've been, we, we, have, we do have projects with federal funding and I know that process always takes a lot longer in those cases. And so, you know, with these, each of these from start to finish uh, took about a year probably to go through a concept of operations and, and then work through the design, construction and, de and deployment. Um, we, we streamlined the process a little bit with, with the construction piece, so it would probably take longer if we put each of these out for separate RFPs, for bids, for contracting, but we've got an on-call uh, electrical contract that has already kind of gone through RFP and vetted, and we, and we utilize that for the construction a lot of these, which, which helped us kind of streamline line that piece of it. Um, Jason, just on your side, um, I, I know that you had to, uh, Western had to build some custom cabinets um, for some of these projects. Can you give us some more details on some of that and, and what was involved with all of that? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's kind of our bread and butter. That's something I, I like most about our company is, you know, being small and nimble allows us to do some things that some of these larger guys aren't able to. And one of those things is being able to make a custom solution, including our cabinets. Uh, so, you know, just to kind of chime in on the previous uh, question was that we like to work closely with the consultants as well because, you know, a lot of these guys have big ideas, but it's taking that idea from paper into reality where we like to kind of be part of the process and show them the newest, latest, greatest technology like these cellular modems uh, that we're able to put into these. When it comes to the cabinet design, it's, it's an interesting process because it, it really requires a lot of back and forth communication between you know John's team, DKS's team, and AI's team as well. So what we like to do is kind of get a, a general base plan of what you're trying to accomplish, where you're trying to put it, how you want to power it, how you want to communicate to it. And by getting that information, we're able to take that into our engineering in our back room. Uh, we've got someone on our team, Tom Rivard. He is a genius. He knows how to make all these things work. He speaks a language that I don't even understand, to be quite frank. But I, I, I think it's great how we can communicate with these guys, listen to what components they want to put in there, communicate with you guys and understand you know, where the cords are going to go, what kind of power draw we're going to need to assume for these, and, and put together a, a real cabinet. And for these projects, uh, we've done special cabinets for all of them, and each cabinet has its own little tweak. You know, For the snow zone cabinets, we needed to make room for the alpha battery backup. So we had to consider where we're gonna put the inverter, where the batteries were gonna fit, where they wouldn't block any airflow to the, the brains of the device. And then we've got some other projects coming up where again, we need to make room for the different components and the different sensors that are gonna be running through this cabinet, but also make it easy for the users to get in there, troubleshoot if anything's going on, and for the contractors, the, the on-call electrical contract that they use so they can understand how to deploy it and, and not have any problems out in the field once it goes out there. So Jason, I'm hearing a lot about collaboration. Um, and I think that is one of those big keys, especially a, a customized project like this, that you know people don't deploy very often. Um, it, it's kind of a first. What Washington County is doing is very much a first. And um, if you collaborate right at the beginning with the county, the cabinet providers, the consultant, the technology provider, everything can be discussed beforehand so you can come up with a concept of operations and a design that works for everybody. I, I want to give kudos to, to John. John, how do you, because you're able to bring all those people together. What's the best way of doing that? How do you go about doing that? You, you know, it's, we have been fortunate. So we've, we've got a great team that we've work, been working with and you know I, I think the key is we've just found people that we know we know we work well with and that are, and that are able to kind of meet the needs for each, each project and so you know one of the big things that we try to do here at the county is you know we we it's so important to build good working relationships with these different vendors with the consultants with the contractors we're working with every day and so we spend a lot of time, you know, m making sure that we're kind of keeping these relationships good standing order so that that type of collaboration can happen. Perfect. John, I, I wanted to actually talk about some of the other um, innovative projects that you guys have deployed. One of the projects we didn't actually talk about was your weather based curve warning system. Can you? Talk us through, I know that's recently been deployed, but can you talk everyone through what is a weather-based curve warning system? Yeah, yeah, no, that's another uh, exciting project that we've, we've recently deployed. It's, you know, 
all these were kind of falling under our kind of, we're calling rural ITS projects. So that's another one that fits in with these. And so basically this system, it's a site uh, where we have a lot of run off the road accidents. And I think people just for whatever reason or another aren't, aren't listening to the, uh, the speed rider warning on that curve sign that that's telling them to slow down. And so this system that we put in, it, it's, it starts with the, it's got a speed feedback sign is the, is the basis background of it. Then it's also got a pavement sensor that's measuring the friction surface of the roadway. And then we've got some advanced warning flashers. And so how this one works the, is uh, the speed feedback sign base, you know, normally just runs with its normal operations. So we've got, a, a, we've got parameters we set in there for speed settings, telling it when to flash at people and when to tell them to slow down. Um, but then the, the ITS piece of that, so what happens is when that pavement sensor uh, measures a friction, the, the road surface friction, and when it drops below a certain level, the system then switches the operation of the speed feedback sign. So the speed values used for the speed feedback drop. So we're telling people to slow down um, at lower speeds. And then at the same time, we're also turning on the uh, advanced warning warning flashers. So some beakers with the slippery when wet sign ahead of that as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, I mean, that's obviously a very innovative uh, solution that you guys have done there. I have not seen anyone else in the market deploy anything like that, um, which is which is very different. I mean, you know, especially on the rural application side. Um, and and what were you using to trigger it? Was it the the temperature of the road or the ice thickness or what? What was the what did you use to trigger that sign? Yeah. So our um, our pavement sensor it, it's a it's a looped uh is the model i believe of the sensor and so it, it takes in a number of different parameters uh the temperature of the road and ice thickness and whether it's wet or dry and it goes through and it calculates internally some sort of, of friction surface level based on those parameters so that, that value of friction level is what we're using at the end to to trigger trigger the change Okay, that's actually great. So in other words, even if the if the road was icy, it would have a low friction level, or even if there was a lot of water on the road, it would get a low friction level, and your driver feedback sign would automatically adjust its um, its condition so it'll show a different slowdown message if the road is slippery, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's fantastic. All right, Alani, you, you've got a couple of other questions there that, uh, that some, some of the people have asked. I do, actually. Um, so I'm going to start with this one. Um, John, how long did it take to install your school zones? Uh, the school zones, we did them all uh, over one summer period. And so um, our system... Like there was some time obviously before they're going into planning and purchasing and procuring all the equipment, but we made sure to have all the equipment there, be, you know, at the beginning of summer. And then really with our uh, signal technicians hit them hard. So we went through slowly a couple sites. What we, we had converted um, from an old system. So we didn't have to replace cabinets. There were just some internal wiring modifications that needed to be made at each cabinet. And so that was the, mostly the time consuming, just taking out the old equipment, the time clock, putting in the new one, making sure that redoing the wiring internally and then uh, testing it all. But um, we, we did them all in over one summer period. Okay. Um, just a follow up. And that's 150 something beacons, I guess, which is quite a lot of beacons to deploy in, in, in the summer. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think when we did it, we were probably at like 140 or so and then we've had some added to it since then but yeah wow that's a lot of beacons <laughs> um and just a follow-up on that one john um what was the installation time for the snow zones and the flood warning system I'm trying to think the the snow zones um probably took about two to three month period um, the flood warning was the flood warning was pretty similar as well. A lot of these projects 
I mean, and that's basically once once the design's complete and we're getting it to our contractor and then our contractors kind of gets going on it. And so, um, you know, a lot of these projects, the, the biggest time consuming piece other than, you know, there's always a lead time with procuring equipment and make sure you got all that set in and lined up with your schedule. But it's just it's basically the underground work for the contractor to put, you know, if there's any poles that need to go in and and running the conduit and feeds to get power and coordination with the power company. So f from the construction side, uh, you know, that's a lot of times the most time consuming piece. Okay. Okay. Um, just want to check, you got any other questions I over there? I got two more. Okay, go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, John, do the dollar savings that you mentioned include um, avoided fuel costs and less maintenance of the vehicles? I, you know, I, I think that definitely is a savings. We, we've never uh, really gone and calculated a dollar amount savings for each of these. It's, you know, kind of what I was referring to is just basically high level knowing your, your staff is spending a lot less time than they used to having to drive out and having to go utilize these systems. So they're able to, they're able to kind of deploy these resources in, for stuff that, that you know, that, that's more important, you know, especially during these winter weather situations. So we'd have staff going out to flip the snow zone signs that, that could be gearing up to help with uh, de-icing operations or snow zone plowing and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, there's, there's always other work that needs to be done at the county. And so a lot of this is like, we're saving staff time being able to deploy them for, for other higher priorities. Yeah, no, I mean, I would imagine driving out to 150 school flashes to go program them. That's going to take, like you said, it, t it took you guys quite a, quite a bit of time, and that definitely cuts down on the amount of trips as well. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And our, our, our electricians have a lot of other things they need to be exactly. uh, taken care of during the summer. <laughs> awesome. I got one more um, question. It says, how many sensors can you have work with a node? That's a, a very technical question, so I'm not sure if <laughs> that, that you might be answer. a better question for AI because I know you know I'm sure I believe you guys have different models and, and different options. Yeah, I mean, there's the, you know uh, I can probably answer that, but it 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 depends on. So in other words, when we have a black box solution like we've deployed in Washington County, we can have uh, they've also got another project that we're going to talk about later, which is a weather warning, um, uh, when I say weather warning, a, a weather monitoring, road weather information system. And there we've got multiple different sensors connected to it that are uh, providing weather information and cameras. So, you know, I, it depends on if, if it's Ethernet or serial communication. So there's a little bit of details there. Uh, if you're looking at connecting more and more devices up, you know, on a traffic signal cabinet, we sometimes connect up to uh, six or seven different devices within the cabinet that are all IP based. So there's no real limit on the number. It's kind of sometimes a limit on the kind of technology that you're using, whether it's serial, Ethernet and so on. Um, yeah, not, not really any kind of limitation on the technology there. Well, I'm glad Peter could answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one might be for Jason. Uh, what are the dimensions of your cabinets? That's a great question. Um, you know, it really depends on the projects. So these ones aren't cookie cutter per se. Uh, if there's a battery backup system going in there obviously we need to make a little bit more room uh, for those as opposed to a smaller just AC powered system without without the needs for that so I can't really give you the specific dimensions they kind of range all over the place but that's kind of part of the the best the best part of it which is that you can make what the dimensions you need to give them to us and, and we can get it figured out for you so you tell us what goes in there and we can we can make an enclosure that that works for it Perfect. Thanks very much, uh, Jason. Thanks, Alana, for all the questions. And thanks, everybody out there for asking the questions. Please go ahead and ask more questions. Um, so what I wanted to do is actually just jump into uh, the live system that they actually have running there. And I'm going to show you guys just what it looks like within the GLAN system. So this is the, as you can see, this is actually the GLAN system here. And it's a Google map-based system. 
and you'll see that they have got all of their school zone beacons. You'll see we talked about the flood warning devices and this is uh, the area over here. You can see it's a, a sewage, they call it sewage lagoon. Don't ask me why it's sewage lagoon, <laughs> but um, that's that area over there that floods where they have the two different crossings there. And then every single device shows up in a different icon. So these are the, the um, snow zone warning devices uh, that show up here in blue. And then down over here is the uh, curve warning and weather sensor system. So each one of these is, you know, accessible through the Glance application. Um, so we can go in and, you know, look at any kind of school zone. And, you know, I'm doing this live right now. Obviously, schools are not on right now. And you can see it's central override off um, because they've actually turned all the beacons off because of uh, COVID-19. And you can click on a beacon and you can, you know, look at more information. What's great with this is I can go in here and I can see straight away that their batteries are really healthy here. They're charging up and discharging nicely. Um, the solar arrays are working really well. So you can see that it's charging and it actually has excess capacity because it's going up to above 20 volts. So as soon as it goes above like 14 volts, uh, that's actually showing that it's got excess capacity there. Um, so each one of these devices has obviously got a whole bunch of information and we've got a number of other sessions that we do uh, where we can go through more details. But you can also access all the devices over here on the, on the left-hand panel as well to actually look at you know, what's actually happening on the, on the different units. And what's great with the platform is you can see all the pictures and things like that, but you can also go into reports and for instance, we can go look at their beacons and we can go and see, you know, these are all showing system voltage, solar array voltage. All of these are, are very good. And if I scroll down here, we'll be able to see anything that jumps out at us. And straight away, you can see over here that we've got some batteries over here that are still good, but you can see the solar panel here isn't producing quite as much. So that's kind of an indication that the potential is that there could be trees that have grown over the, uh, the actual uh, solar panels there, or potentially the solar panels are getting dirty. So those are the kinds of areas that you should go look at. So with all of our technology, we use AI, we call it applied information, but we also use artificial intelligence, play on the words, to go and actually look at how the batteries are charging, discharging, and then to basically go in and um, you know improve improve a lot of the um, response times to actually go out and fix these things. So, with that said, what I actually wanted to do was ask John, John, you know, obviously now uh, I believe you guys are working a little bit more from home. Your technicians are working a little bit from home. How has this helped you guys during this new COVID-19 era that we're in, um, you know, and actually managing all your resources? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Again, you, you really just having, being able to monitor and see this stuff remotely make, helps us a lot more flexible, be a lot more flexible with this type of situation. And so, you know, we've get questions or requests that come in from the public. Um, you know, our staff is all, you know, we've got a staff of electricians, signal technicians that are basically out fixing stuff throughout the county every day. And so if something comes in, you know, even if they only have their cell phone on them or something, they're able to bring it up and look and look at the device and check health and at least do some basic troubleshooting for these. Um, and then with me as well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, all of us are now sitting at home remote. And so, um, you know, it's a lot more difficult to access it if we'd have to be into the office each time. And so with my regular web browser, I just have to get in and log in and I'm able to kind of kind of check something out if we get a question or something comes up that looks that looks weird. Well, thanks for sharing that, John. And just, um, you know, these systems are all new ideas, the ones that you've deployed, obviously, after the school zones. Um, what gave you the confidence um, to deploy these? 
Yeah, you know, I, I think we've been fortunate. We've, we've got a great team to lean on. I think we mentioned that before. And, and you know, really the county, we, we've got a really great management team from our director to our county commissioners who they believe in the future of these types of ITS treatments and, and they support taking, taking these types of smart calculated risks. So a lot of these projects, you know, it's, it's, they build off of previous successes we've had. And so, you know, they don't seem too daunting as we're getting into them because, you know, we're, we're taking smaller steps, not trying to bite off like, like six, seven, eight, nine di different new things each time. So with that, you know, we're trying each time to learn what we've done previously and, and try to minimize the risk of failure by, by keeping our approach each time, you know, as simple as we can kind of make it while still meeting our main operational objectives. And what are, maybe you want to take us through some of the lessons that you guys have learned, um, you know, in deploying these complex systems. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, one of the lessons is, you know, you go through the concept of operations piece and it, it's really easy during that time to get sidetracked and start making things really, really complicated. Um, you know, but at, at the end of the day, I think one of the things we learn is, is, you know, there are key things that as long as like, if you're able to stick with some of the off the shelf solutions and tie those together, it's really going to make your life a lot simpler than to try to re re-engineer something from, from scratch. And so, you know, you know, that's a big thing is just build off of what stuff, you know, already works out there and that you've had, had success with. Um, I know our, our, our floodgate project it was interesting because our concept of operations started out we were going to automate the full opening and shutting of the gates and, and all that thinking like oh this would be cool you just push the button the gates shut all by themselves and you know as we thought through that it, it was doing that really increased the complexity of the project and it didn't add much value from uh staff time savings or that type of thing because you know really as we talked to our work groups that were going out there they, they were still going to need to go out because the, the the closure area is long enough that you can't see all the way across it and so they'd still have to go out and make sure there's nobody stuck out there before they close it and then and then the same thing when they open it back up you know there's usually a bunch of debris and trees and all kinds of stuff on the road so it was they were still going to have staff out there to clear all that out so at the end of the day it's kind of like what well, you know what this is add so much complexity to try to automate the opening and shutting of these Let, let's keep it simple and uh and get what we still need out of it and and so i think with that it, that kind of helped that one be a success Okay, so, so basically keep it, keep simple, it simple and use technology that you know works ahead of time instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and come up with some complex thing that no one can provide. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I know there's, and you know, I've asked the question a lot of these to, to Jason and you guys as we're going into these, you know, there's, there's a lot of these sensors, there's different manufacturers makes models and so we try to figure out ones that you guys have already done the legwork on uh to work with and that you know you can integrate with and so you know i think that's always an important question to ask like you know which have you used before for this type of type of application perfect well we've only got about uh, a minute left so i wanted to just uh, thank everyone for joining us i really want to thank john and jason for joining us today and western systems for for jointly sponsoring this session. Um, if anyone's got any questions or wants to be contacted on this, please chat out and, and reach out to us. We'll contact you, we'll get you in contact with John Fasana as well if you've got any questions for him. Um, so really appreciate it and thanks so much for joining us today, everybody. Yes, thank you everybody.